Hello, I'm Falcon Fieldhouse. I'm a pottery teacher. I've been making pottery for about 40 years, commercially as a craft potter, selling my pottery at craft fairs and in cafes and restaurants. But I prefer teaching. I'm digging my elbows into my waist and I'm putting all my effort into coning this lump of clay. Because so many people who, when they were at school, never had the chance to learn pottery and uh, are now in their middle ages and they want to actually learn to make pots. But the amount of practice that you need to be able to throw a pot on the wheel takes a lot of time, months, sometimes years, whereas you can make a decent coil pot in a couple of hours. So I'll be showing you how to make a coil pot. It takes a lot longer to make a coil pot than it would to throw one. So when I say you can make one on the wheel much more easily, that's only when you're experienced and you can throw a pot a minute, whereas it would take you at least a couple of hours to throw a decent cut to coil a decent coil pot. I like to make all kinds of thrown pots, bowls, vases, from a small egg cup size, which actually is as much trouble to make as a much larger milk jug, but they're, they're all fun to make and you, you get a certain amount of satisfaction looking at a pot that you've made. I, I like to make pots, I like to decorate them, I like glazing, there are lots of different methods of decorating. When you first make a pot you're using green body. Green in the sense that it hasn't dried out, it's nothing to do with the colour, it's known as greenware. When you've made the pot, it has to dry, it has to be 100% dry before you can fire it in a kiln. Now, in olden times, potters couldn't get to the temperature required to make a non-porous pot. To be non-porous, it has to be fired to well over 1,000 degrees, at least 1,250 degrees. Most of the pottery that you will find that's been dug up from many, many years ago will have only been biscuit fired. It will have only been fired on a pit firing to about 900 degrees, possibly a thousand degrees, but that's really pushing it. So the clay remains porous. When I tell my students that they could be making a pot now, which would still be around in a thousand years time, they laugh. But then I show them some of the pottery which has been made 1600 years ago and which is in perfect condition, and they are absolutely amazed. Here I'm kneading a lump of clay which has been recycled, so it's clay which pots have been made from, or it might be the turnings which I've re uh, placed into water and let the clay dry out so that it's workable. I'm kneading it just to make sure it's well mixed. You can use a machine uh, to do this for you, but most craft potters We'll do it by hand. Further preparation of the clay is done by wedging. This is to remove the air bubbles. And any lump of clay, even taken from a, a brand new bag of clay from the supplier, might be containing the air bubbles which would cause the pot to explode. Throwing it down on your wedging slab, throwing it down quite hard for about five minutes or so gets rid of all the air bubbles. Right, that's that. Now I'll just slap it into a nice Brown ball. Every thrown pot has to be centred before the clay can actually be thrown. So prepare your clay by kneading and wedging and with the correct size lump of clay, usually by weight, for the size of the pot you want to make, throw the clay down onto the wheel head with the wheel going anti-clockwise and start to center it by first of all coning the lump of clay. And here I'm making absolutely sure that the clay is central before I go any further. There must be no wobble whatsoever. And now using my thumb I'm opening up the clay using my right thumb as you can see and my left hand is supporting my right hand all the time always using two hands on the wheel the right hand on the right hand side of the clay 
the left hand on the top at the moment, but this changes as you go on. So I'm now opening up, making the pot wider and slightly taller by squeezing with my left fingers on the inside and right forefinger on the outside. Always work on the right hand side of the pot so that the clay is running away from the fingers. Now you can see the, the top of the pot has a very very slight wobble on it at the moment and I'm going to remove that because it's important for the later stage of turning the pot upside down on the wheel that the, the top of the pot is absolutely even both sides. So with a needle in your right hand you push the needle into the clay towards the fingers of your left hand and lift off the ring then with a piece of sponge and the right hand is holding the sponge the left hand is guiding the sponge towards the correct part of the pot I'm using a tool to put a decorative ring around the neck of the pot and using a sponge just to get the top of the pot clean and smooth. Then before the pot's removed from the wheel a wooden turning tool is used to clean off part of the clay at the bottom where it's attached to the wheel so that when the wire is passed through it doesn't pass through a lot of soft clay so wet the top of the wheel, push a clay cutter like a cheese cutter through the bottom of the pot take the pot in your hand and place onto a small bat so that it can be left until it goes leather hard These pots, the body of which is uh, an earthenware clay, not terracotta, and it could have been fired to a much higher temperature if they'd had the ability to do that, but as they are only fired to about 900, between 900 and 1000 degrees, they remain porous. They didn't have the ability to make them watertight, so any liquid or any food put into these would contain for many many years the elements of that food so it would be possible to tell what these people had been consuming. The way that we stop that happening now is to fire to stoneware which makes the clay totally unabsorbent. This pot for example was fired about 30 years ago to stoneware temperature and would if it didn't have holes in it, it would be to totally watertight. A pot as small as this could be made reasonably easily, nowadays even, on a kick wheel. But a lot of people find it difficult to uh, control the speed of their foot and coordinate it with their hand movements, so electric wheels are much easier to use. And when you start to throw very large pots, an electric wheel is much much easier because you can pick up a speed without the effort that you would be putting into pedalling a kick wheel. This little pot, obviously at the time that it was made, was made on a wheel which was either rotating by having somebody pushing a slab of stone, a round slab of stone in an anti-clockwise direction or it could have been a kick wheel. How it's decorated, well I can see that it's been fired in a pit because the clay is covered with the, the black which is sometimes caused, as in this case, by the smoke in the fire, but it could also have been coated with some form of oxide. 
before it was actually oxided, dipped into a slip possibly, it had some form of resist painted on it. Now, nowadays we use a wax resist to get a design like that. I don't know what the early potter used, but it's some kind of resistant material so that when the pot was dipped into the glaze, having had the design applied, the glaze or the slip didn't actually adhere to where the wax or whatever the resist material was. This pot has got traces of the fingerprints of the potter, where the potter has held the pot between his or her fingers and dipped it into the slip to give this dark colour coating. So it would literally have been held between a thumb and two forefingers like this and dipped in. Looking at this lovely pot, I can almost see exactly what the potter's hands were doing when he made it. Because I've just made one to replicate it. It's beautifully thin. It's got smoke decoration, which is not actually meant to be there, but that happens in the firing. But the first thing that is obvious to me is that it's only been fired to about 900 degrees, and therefore if you put water in this, or any liquid, it would eventually soak into the body of the pot. And that cannot be removed by washing, no matter, what, no matter how high a temperature you wash the pot in. But it is a lovely pot, beautiful to hold. I can actually see inside where the potter's fingers formed the pot. And he, or she, has used a tool on the outside while the pot was rotating to get this ring, which is in fact a form of decoration. And I can actually see where the edge of the tool lifted the clay and deposited it back in some areas. So he hasn't gone around afterwards and carefully smoothed it off, he's just taken it off the wheel. He was probably producing dozens at a time and making them very quickly. Archaeologists talk about the fabric of a pot. Well, this, this would be uh, an unknown term in, in pottery language because we call the, the, the pot that has been made out of a clay body so it's the body of the pot. Also looking at the underneath of this pot I see that the potter has turned a foot ring in the bottom. I like to have foot rings in my pots because when they're standing on an uneven surface they don't wobble but the other advantage of a foot ring is that it thins out the bottom of the pot so the potter is saving a little bit of clay which you can use again. It enables him to make this foot ring. Obviously that pot is, is very light because it's small but it would have been much heavier had he left the base totally flat as in that case. So nice foot ring and oh this one this one does wobble a little bit but that's uh, you know it's a very, very nicely handmade pot, so I'm not criticising it. Some of the pots from the cemetery are also marked. Their owners, or the families of their owners, have marked the bottoms of the pots. This one with a cross. When making a coil pot it's important to be prepared with the correct tools, so slats of wood to get the same thickness of the base both sides, a rolling pin and a board to work on. Placing the rolled out clay onto a turntable preferably, which makes it easier to actually apply the coils, then taking another lump of clay about the size decent size of a sausage, it depends on the size of the pot that you're making and also the, the amount of area you've got to work in but it's better to, as soon as you can, to roll out the clay, use both hands, use the full length of your hands to roll the clay out and if you get any oval pieces 
just tap them back into a round shape. Apply slip, which is in a, a pot with a paintbrush. Apply slip to the base where the first coil is going to join. Now, if the clay is really wet, you don't need the slip, but it's always better to use a little bit. Slip is simply liquid clay. Here you can see where I've joined up three or four coils and I'm using a continuous coil so if the coil happens to be 18 inches long I'll use the whole of that piece of clay but some people like to make individual coils for each particular part of the pot where I, I just use whatever I've got of a, a long coil before I add the next one. Applying slip between each coil of clay and building up the shape you want. Now it's important if you want the pot to start wide and then become narrow and then wide again you actually place the coils in the position which is going to give you the shape. Don't try and bend it into shape after you've applied them. So here I had coils being placed on top of each other fairly wide then I started to narrow them as the pot grew. Now I'm just applying the last one or two coils. This is the last coil in fact to round the top of the pot off you can see it's quite rough at the moment. Coil pots are often left like that. If you want to make a coil pot look as if it's been thrown, then a lot of smoothing out can be done at this stage while the clay is still very damp. But you don't want to wet it too much because you want it to start to dry out so that when it's leather hard, there's another process known as beating, which you can do to get a much smoother finish. So I'm just checking that the pot looks an even shape and doing final adjustments, then it'll be left to go leather hard. Coiling is a lovely way of making pots. What I will also do is put my initials on the bottom so that when somebody digs it up in a thousand years time they'll say somebody with the initials MF made this. And that's all they will know about me.